Sounds great. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Minnesota Department of Health Stroke Education Series. This month's topic is on tenecteplase and stroke, what we've learned one year later. We are very excited to welcome back the M Health Fairview team as they present information and learnings one year after system wide implementation of tenecteplase. Before we get started, we're just going to go over a couple of housekeeping items and MDH stroke program updates. Then I'll turn the stage over to Dr. Strive and Sarah. This webinar is part of the MDH stroke program monthly education series. Stay tuned to your email for a different educational opportunity each month. Please note that this webinar is being recorded today. You can access all previously recorded MDH webinars on our MDH YouTube playlist. Your lines have been muted upon entry. Please ask questions by typing them in the chat throughout the presentation or wait until the close of the presentation as we have built in some time for Q&A with our team today. If we, go, if we don't get to all of your questions, we will try to address them in the follow-up email. The 2022 Stroke Quality Improvement Awards for Hospitals launched in March. Consider applying and showcasing your great QI work. You can check out the Stroke Quality Improvement Awards MDH webpage to access more information and the application. Please direct any further questions to Allie. We have also kicked off our first year of Quality Improvement Awards for EMS agencies. Details will be available on the website soon, and you can direct any further questions about this to Catherine. Stroke Awareness Month of May is just around the corner. Please check out all the available resources and events to help raise awareness within your own community and healthcare organizations. For example, we've provided just a few highlights for you. The MDH Every Second Count Stroke Awareness materials and graphics are available for free download for any healthcare organization. Each graphic file includes the MDH logo, and also you can add your own hospital logo to any of those files. These stroke awareness materials are available in English, Hmong, Somali, and Spanish. Submit a toolkit request via the MDH website. The BeFast Stroke Communications Toolkit is a companion guide on how to use the materials and is also available on the website. And you can please just reach out to our program if you have any further questions about that. Gen and Tech has a stroke urgency toolkit, including patient and community education materials, resources, and more. You can direct any questions to Brad with Gen and Tech. Strides for Stroke Awareness Walk is taking place on May 21st in multiple locations in the Twin Cities, St. Cloud, and Duluth, as well as virtually. You can find more details on the Minnesota Stroke Association website and direct any questions to that organization. And also just announced, please save the date for the American Heart Association Minnesota Stroke webinar on July 21st. I will send out a flyer with registration info. It will go out with the webinar follow-up email. All right, so on to the main event. We are very excited to welcome back the M Health Fairview Stroke team as they share their learnings one year after utilization of tenecteplase in their acute stroke care. Dr. Christopher Stride is the Cerebrovascular Director for M Health Fairview and also the University of Minnesota Vascular Neurology Fellowship Director. Sarah Anker is the manager for the M Health Fairview Cerebrovascular Program. Dr. Stribe and Sarah will discuss off-label investigative uses of tenecteplase and alteplase. The presentation will be followed by a short Q&A. And so at this time, I'm very pleased to turn the present presentation role over to Sarah. You guys can take it from here. Great. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. PowerPoint up. Yes, looks great. Great. All right. So um, Dr. Strive and I will be providing a um, one year update on um, our transition to um, tenecteplase um, as our standard um, IV thrombolytic for um, acute stroke uh, treatment, ischemic stroke treatment. Um, and I will let um, Dr. Strive go ahead and get started. Great, thanks. Thanks for the introduction and, and thanks for asking us to come back. 
So it's kind of a, a reminder of how fast time goes because I, I think we feel like we just presented the um, Connect to Place conversion to, to the group. And uh, we specifically designed this um, discussion to be fairly short, um, just so that we could focus on questions at the end. I think that may have um, the highest yield for some of the um, for some of the group here. But I'll overview some of the things that I talked about uh, initially in terms of Connect to Place and the uh, um, doing it. So this is produced from native TPA. It's used re using recombinant DNA, and it's a protein that's modified at three locations. And this gives it a favorable pharmacokinetic and pharmacological profile compared to TPA. That includes a 15-fold higher fiber affinity, so that means that it's active at the clot rather than systemically. And that's greater resistance to inactivation by plasminogen activator inhibitor 1. And that's why it can be given as um, uh, just a five-second bolus instead of the one-minute bolus plus infusion. Next slide, please. So as, as background, it was first really tested as a, a fibrinolytic for myocardial infarction. This is the ASCENT-2 study in the, in the end of the 90s. And at that point, it was, uh, um, it was actually sort of equally effective in MI uh, and had less bleeding complications. So there, there became some interest for it in ischemic stroke. Um, where we are now is there's been one randomized control trial at the ATNK that was completed mostly in New Zealand and Australia. And, and that was a trial of large vessel occlusion where uh, its next place was superior, not uh, equivalent or, or um, sort of non-inferior, but uh, actually superior to all the place. And um, there's been a recent meta-analysis, or not so recent now, I think 2019 or 2020 in stroke, uh, looking at five previous randomized controlled trials that show non-inferiority between tenecta place and all the place. Tenecta place is easier to administer, and it can facilitate a five-second push without an infusion. And then um, there is potential cost effectiveness. So uh, Tenecta Place um, costs $6,500 according to drugs.com, while Tenecta Place costs uh, a little over $9,000. This is different uh, you know, per hospital and how they um, sort of are priced these medications. But uh, the caveat is, unlike all the place, if you mix Tenecta Place for a stroke code, if, if you're preparing to give it and you don't, it's not replaced by Genentech. So there is kind of this downstream cost for wasted next place that does not apply to all the place. Just a little bit more about the pharmacokinetics. Um, next slide, please. So this uh, was a sub-study of a test. The test was one of the randomized controlled trials. And, and within a test, uh, they took 30 patients that were either given TPA uh, and Tenecta place. And um, they took coagulation markers from the patient before the clot buster was given at three hours, 12 hours, and then 24 hours uh, after the clot buster. And they looked at PT, activated PTT, and then markers of fibrinolysis, as well as markers of um, a sort of systemic coagulopathy. Next slide. So you can see here when you look at PT and PTT, um, it's a little bit small, but all the plates are the lines with uh, the circle at the time point, uh, and connected plates are the lines with the square at the time point. You can sort of see that. Systemically, uh, PT, activated PTT, and then uh, fibrinogen, which would be markers of the systemic coagulopathy, um, are really not significantly changed with synecta place. Whereas with TPA, uh, there is you know, sort of uh, considerable systemic change. And this is measuring activity of the fibrinolytic agent uh, systemically on a, on a blood draw, not actually at the clot itself. Next slide, please. And then if we look at some of the markers of actually uh, of clot breakdown, sort of, of uh, fibrinolysis, if you look at D-dimer, if you look at uh, FDP, um, you can see that for tenecta place, there's this uh, initial peak at six hours that's higher than that of alta place. And then if you look at plasminogen, you can also see this is also a systemic marker of coagulopathy. You can see that plasminogen is not decreased systemically with tenecta place in the same way with alta place. So again, just more... Uh, um, pharmacologic evidence of um, clot lysis without systemic coagulopathy. Next slide. And then we see the same thing here with factor five. Um, the middle one is, is maybe important this plasminogen activator inhibitor one activity. This is the reason, uh, again, for sort of the short half life of TPA. And you can see that at six hours, it's much higher um, in, in patients receiving TPA. And then F1 and, uh, and two are, are fragments of. Um, 
clot breakdown, you can see there's there's not much change there. So there is a suggestion that pharmacokinetically and pharmacologically that tenexaplase is superior. Next slide. And um, and these are the the current guidelines, and I'll um, just talk about this, and then one of the the trials here quickly afterwards. Um, as of right now, if you look at the acute ischemic stroke guidelines from the AHA and the American Heart Association, um, they have said that it may be reasonable to choose tenexaplase at a dose of 0.25 milligrams per kilogram over alteplase in patients without contraindications for IV fibrinolysis who are also eligible to undergo mechanical thrombectomy. So this is the direct uh, sort of interpretation from Extend IATMK, one of the positive trials. There's another recommendation here. Next slide, please. Uh, for tenecta place in the American Heart Association, uh, American Stroke Association guidelines. And this is for minor stroke, and this is uh, really taken from the NORTEST trial. And they said that 0.4 milligrams per kilogram, so a different dose, uh, is not proven to be superior or not inferior. Uh, it is a negative trial, but might be considered as uh, an alternative to all the place in patients with minor neurologic impairment and no major intracranial occlusion. So the guidelines leave people in a, in a bit of a difficult position if, if they're um, thinking about tenecaplase conversion. One, there's two different doses. Two, this doesn't apply to all stroke patients. It applies to a subset of severe stroke patients with large vessel occlusion that are going to undergo thrombectomy. And then the other end of the spectrum with a higher dose, um, it applies to patients with minor stroke. Um, and then there's a gap in the middle. So if applied directly from the American Heart Association guidelines, you would use two different doses, and uh, for the middle ground of patients with moderate stroke without large vessel occlusion, you'd still be using alteplase. And there's actually some um, sites that have done this, well, although I, I think that it might be quite complicated in, um, in the setting of stroke codes. Next slide, please. So just in, in terms of interpreting, uh, or interpreting uh, these, these trials that we're gonna talk about here in a second, there's the modified Rankin scale, which I think almost all of us are very familiar with. Uh, but basically, it's a disability scale from zero to six, with zero being no symptoms and, uh, and six being dead. And obviously, the closer to zero you are, the less disability you have. So zero to two is excellent. Your independence is preserved. And then non-independent, you can ambulate as, as an MRS3. Four, you cannot ambulate, but you're not bed-bound and requiring constant care. And then five and six are sort of considered unacceptable outcomes. So with that, let's just take a look at uh, NOR test. So this is the trial that looked at... Um, patients with minor stroke, that wasn't really um, the inclusion criteria of the trial, but in NORTEST, they did enroll predominantly minor stroke and stroke skills less than seven. And they really had a high percentage of, of TIA as well. And so it's not surprising when you look at NORTEST and you see MRS scores zero, one, and two, those are the green uh, bars there. Those would be the sort of the excellent functional outcomes, people that maintain independence. You can see that that number is really high because if you have minor stroke, then of course the recovery uh, is, is likely to be good in the end. And so between tenecteplase and alteplase, there's really no difference. Now, um, this is a negative trial and non-inferiority is actually a statistical test that, that has to be proven. Um, and so it's important to know that NORTEST is not a, a trial that shows equivalence or non-inferiority. Numerically, the numbers are equivalent um, and the outcomes look very similar. However, uh, statistically, and, and in the medical community, we cannot interpret nor test as showing equivalence between the two um, between the two agents. It does not. There was a, a test for uh, non-inferiority as part of the study, and, and tenecteplase did not meet it. So, nor test is a negative study. Although, if we look at the numbers, we would say, you know, it looks like there's probably equivalence between these two um, these two interventions. The actual statistical study of non-inferiority was not met um, in this trial. Next slide. And then extend IATNK. So this is the other trial in, informing the guidelines, and this is the um, the trial that looks at patients with large vessel occlusion. So this is any adult uh, who was independent at baseline who had a large vessel occlusion of the ICA, the internal carotid artery, the uh, first two branches of the middle cerebral artery, the M1 and the M2, and the basilar artery. They also had to receive thrombolytics sort of conventionally within four and a half hours of stroke. Uh, and then endovascular treatment had to begin within six hours of stroke onset. So this is kind of a um, uh, more um, or, or an earlier trial that, that used more conventional definitions of endovascular treatment and thrombolytic treatment. And the primary outcome was reperfusion of more than 50% or absence of thrombus on, on the angiogram. So it's actually a radiographic outcome that was being assessed. Next slide. And when you look at these patients, most of them received thrombolytics 
uh, about two hours after the onset of their large vessel occlusion. And then most of them uh, then also were in the, the cath lab um, and, and had their initial first run in the cath lab within an hour. So these patients are being intervened on and, and intervened on quickly. Uh, about a quarter of these patients are transferred, so they actually uh, received the lytic at one hospital and then were transferred to another hospital. But most patients had arrived in uh, sort of the comprehensive stroke center, received thrombolytic, and then went directly to, uh, to IR. Next slide. Uh, and, and these are the outcomes here. I think if you hit the, the slide again, is there um, maybe a, a little bar that will show up to, to highlight some of these outcomes? Um, yeah, so if we look at the primary outcome, the way that the trial was designed, um, one in five patients, 22% of the patients receiving place, the large vessel occlusion actually recanalized. So at the time of um, going to IR and taking that first image, the clot was either not there or it was so distal it was, um, it was sort of unretrievable. And in the Altaplace group, that, was, that only happened 10% of the time. So this was a significantly different outcome uh, and showed the benefit of tenecteplase uh, when compared to TPA in terms of outcomes. And then if we look at the secondary outcomes, um, the, um, this early recanalization actually also then led to better functional outcome, which you know, it does make sense. The, the earlier the clot opens, the earlier the brain is reperfused the smaller the stroke and the better the, um, the eventual recovery. Uh, and, and this is actually quite impressive if you think about it. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, the reason that this trial was actually designed to have radiographic outcomes is the, you know, the suspicion that such an intervention could cause uh, a major clinical effect was a little bit surprising. So if you think about patients who are coming in with the ambulance or going to CT, and then um, after CT and CTA, they're found to have large vessel occlusion, and uh, one set of, of patients gets selected place, one set of patients gets also placed. Then they move on to the cath lab. After the cath lab, 86% of selected place patients have reperfusion, 81% of, of TPA patients have reperfusion. And you see this 13% difference in independent recovery at the end. Um, it's, it's really sort of phenomenal. There's really only a very short time uh, between these two um, interventions before the sort of what we consider the defini definitive intervention which is the thrombectomy. And so that early reperfusion um, uh, within the, the tenecteplase group really powered uh, this independent recovery, and it really shows the, the impact potentially of recanalizing large vessel occlusion and doing that early. Next slide. So these are the outcomes on the modified Rankin scale. So again, you wanna shift left, the lower the number, the less disability. So you wanna be in those light blue colors. And you can really see in the tenecteplase group that there's a quite a, a bit of left shift uh, with less disability in patients that still went on to get thrombectomy very quickly. Um, and, and this is really probably what triggered most of the um, interest in, in shifting to the next place. Next slide. If you look at the safety outcomes, um, they were very similar. So death, which is probably not really related to symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, but related to complications of stroke, uh, was higher in the Altaplace group. And then symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, which is the next line down there, was, um, was the same between both groups. Next slide. This um, sort of uh, data has been shown also in basilar artery occlusion. This is just another paper that was published in neurology and showed that in patients with basilar artery occlusion, tenecteplase place recanalized 26%, whereas in Alta place it was less than 10%. And this was despite uh, tenecteplase place having a much shorter time from administration to uh, initiation of the angiogram. And so it's probably the increased fibrin uh, sense of uh, specificity of tenecteplase that really drives this effect that we're seeing. And it seems to be predominantly in large vessel occlusions. If you think back to NORTEST, which is a trial of more minor stroke, we really didn't see um, the same market difference in outcome. Next slide. Uh, so then, um, you know, what about non-large vessel occlusions? How do we, do we interpret this data? Well, um, in 2019, five of the randomized control trials that were done um, were then put into a meta-analysis. And basically, um, and we don't need to go through the meta-analysis in detail, but it, this uh, meta-analysis did show non-inferiority, which means that tenecteplase place is not worse than, uh, than TPA if you aggregate all five of these trials. Uh, we can go to the next slide and, and take a look at the, um, these plots here. And basically, this is for functional independence, and you can see that um, it, uh, it is non-inferior, non -inferior, that diamond that's there, it's actually shifted to the right significantly past zero, which would be a sort of equivalent. So it does suggest that there, there may be a treatment effect, 
but it certainly shows uh, non-inferiority, which means that synecdoche plate is not worse. And, you know, do we care that something's not worse? We usually run trials to look at superiority. Well, we do care if it's not worse, if it's easier to give and it's potentially more cost effective. If you have an inter intervention that is as effective as the current standard of care, but it's easier to administer and it's more cost effective, then that would be reason to, uh, to adopt it. And so non-inferiority in this setting is, is actually really important. So you can go to the next slide. Um, they also looked at non-inferiority for symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. And um, they were sort of unable to prove non-inferiority in, in this population. And that's just because the rate of hemorrhage uh, in both the TPA patients and the um, tenecta place patients was so low that um, it's really hard to do a statistical analysis when you're not having very many outcomes of, of interest. So it's a good thing that there's so few symptomatic intracranial hemorrhages that it's hard to, to prove non-inferiority. And if you look at the actual numbers, they are essentially the same. Next slide. Uh, we can we can just skip through this one. This is just an, another um, modified rank and scale plot. So with that said, I'll turn things over to to Sarah and um, and we'll talk about uh, the actual implementation. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, so just as a review, we um, transition to ten place as our standard IB thrombolytic across um, the M Health Fairview system in February and February of 2021. Um, it was a sub project of our system-wide um, ischemic stroke care pathway, which was aimed at improving um, clinical outcomes, reducing length of stay, um, decreasing overutilization of um, staff resources and supplies, and, and really focused on um, standardize, standardizing care for ischemic stroke patients um, across our system. The M Health Fairview system has uh, two comprehensive stroke centers, um, one at the university and then one um, Southdale in Edina, Minnesota, and um, one primary stroke center, which is um, St. John's in the um, East Metro. And then we have six um, acute stroke ready hospitals um, that are um, kind of located um, throughout the state, um, both in um, more urban um, areas with woodwinds and um, ridges, and then um, further north, um, lakes, Northland, um, Grand Itasca, and Range. So just briefly, um, I want to touch on um, kind of the actual implementation plan. Um, so um, kind of our first um, step was really to I think um, bring attention to um, the possible benefits of transitioning to Tenecta Place um, and really ensure that um, we got in front of those key stakeholders. So for our system, um, we had physician champions, um, Dr. Strive, obviously, um, but also engaged um, ED leadership um, early and um, they were um, champions as well. Pharmacy, our nursing practice and clinical education team, um, really when you think about um, the ease of administration, um, they, were, they were partners. Um, operations leaders from both our uh, neuroscience um, and um, emergency department um, service line and domains, um, and then actually um, informatics and um, our EPIC team. And again, um, Dr. Stripe kind of covered our key messaging um, but there is evidence of equivalence and potential for superiority, cost effectiveness, um, and ease of administration were our um, big selling points. Um, just as you're thinking um, about this um, potential, potential transition, excuse me, um, some additional considerations um, to touch on. Um, as Dr. Stride mentioned, um, there are some systems and and sites that um, have maintained both Altaplace and um, Tenecteplace um, in their in their standards, um, they may have um, differing doses of Tenecteplace um, that they're using, um, and so that's a consideration that you need to make. Um, for us, we transition to um, Tenecteplace as our standard IV thrombolytic, um, using a single um, standard dose, which um, we'll cover here in a minute. Um, and we did that primarily for um, safety reasons. Um, we wanted to, um, you know, avoid any um, potential um, unnecessary medication errors. 
Um, ER optimization um, was a big one that I don't um, think that we necessarily um, understood the scope of until we were in the project. Um, Alteplace is kind of all over in your EMR and your policies and, and protocols. Um, and so um, to make that transition, we really had to make sure that we were um, retiring those old Alteplace orders um, and making sure um, that we had a stroke specific um, Tenecta Place um, medication order, again, to avoid potential uh, medication errors errors as Tenecta Place is used for other indications outside of ischemic stroke. Um, documentation, again, updating your note templates. Um, I think I'll, this is very important as um, we think about um, stroke certification visits. So um, replacing Alta Place um, with Tenecta Place or um, largely what we've tried to do in our documentation and note templates is um, just use a general term um, IV thrombolytic or, or thrombolysis. Um, and then accessibility. Staff still kind of use TPA, Tenecta Place, those terms interchangeably. And so we had to make sure that in all of our search engines, whether it was in our electronic medical record um, or our internet, um, that we kept those um, all to place TPA as um, synonyms for um, Tenecta Place because we don't want um, staff who need information on the fly to have to be, you know, searching multiple terms. So those are just some additional considerations to think about as you um, make that transition. One other, um, one other area um, that I would encourage you to think about is um, your your learning and your education, um, especially for um, your nursing staff and, and pharmacy, we really focused um, the education on um, the differences between Tenecta Place and Alta Place. Um, we didn't, you know, kind of build in a a lot of additional stroke education, um, and and really just focused on the differences and kind of. Um, what staff really needed to know um, to make that transition. And then um, just a little bit about, um, you know, our safety monitoring um, actual kind of orders that we introduced um, with this. Um, with this project, so um, we updated our um, inclusion and exclusion criteria, um, our document. Um, you know, now has um, within the definitions that this is for Alta Place or Tenecta Place for the treatment of um, acute ischemic stroke. Um, but those inclusion and exclusion criteria um, are essentially um, the same as um, as what they were with Alta Place. And then some of our safety and monitoring standards. So, um, Dr. Strive. Um, you know, touched on the evidence um, for dosing, and um, we have a 0.25 um, milligram per kilogram um, standard dose in our system with um, the maximum dose being 25 milligrams. Um, as far as administration, um, you know, we went system wide um, with our rollout, and so we had some variability in practice across the system um, as far as who was mixing um, and delivering the um, Tenecta place. So we allowed sites to maintain their um, current process. So we do have some sites in the system um, where the nurse is um, mixing at the bedtime bedside. And then we have other sites where pharmacy is um, mixing either in the emergency department or um, in centralized um, pharmacy and um, then delivering to the bedside. Um, I think that's a future um, quality improvement project um, that we are looking at is, um, again, you know, how can we drive down those um, door to needle times? Um, so we're as, as efficient and um, safe as possible and looking at, um, you know, processes and opportunities um, to standardize um, that, that mixing and um, delivery process across our system. But for now, we allowed sites to maintain their current, their historical um, process. Um, we wrestled with this one, and again, you guys who are um, coming up on um, Joint Commission, DMB, um, Acute Stroke Ready, um, 
certification visits? Um, do you need a saline flush order? Um, everyone knows, um, you know, kind of the pitfalls um, with Alta Place. And ultimately, we determined that we do not did not need a normal saline like separate order um, for flush that our medication administration policies um, and standard and kind of nursing standard practice um, covered us. Um, we did include um, in the administration instructions reminders to um, flush with normal saline and, and pointed out that um, it's not compatible with um, dextrose containing solutions. And I'll say we've had um, subsequently um, three um, three certification um, visits. And so we've kind of had this discussion with surveyors um, and um, and our um, our practices um, and um, policies when it, within the system have kind of um, held so far, and um, we haven't had any findings um, or um, requirements to add that normal saline flush as a separate order. Um, and then with monitoring, we went um, with a um, single pre and post um, administration blood pressure target of 180 over 105. Um, Dr. Stribe will talk a little bit more about um, that in a couple of slides. Um, just again, um, thinking about the delivery, this is a bolus only over five seconds. Um, you don't really have um, time to continue to titrate um, those blood pressure medications and hit those blood pressure targets. So um, we did go with a, with a standard of 180 over 105. Um, and then our vital sign and um, neuro assessments um, as far as frequency, um, we rolled out with standard of care. So Q15 minutes um, for two hours, then Q30 um, minutes for six hours, and then hourly um, until you hit that 24 hour Mark, um, our, um, mo and I'll talk a little bit more, but our monitoring standards um, really did not change um, when we made that transition from Alta Place to, um, to Nectar Place. So this is just a screenshot of our actual to Nectar Place order. Um, one of the things that I wanna point out is that it's a specific medication order or ERX um, that is just for ischemic stroke. Um, this is what's built into all of our order sets and order panels. And so, um, you know, not that a mistake um, couldn't happen, but man, someone would have to try really, really hard um, to order um, the wrong dose of, of Tenecta Place. Um, within our administration instructions, we have those blood pressure targets um, administer as an IV bolus over five seconds, our maximum dose of 25 milligrams. Um, and again, um, the fact that it's not com compatible with D5 um, solutions. So this is a, a screenshot of our actual order. And this is a screenshot of um, a of our um, medication administration instructions or our MAR. Um, and this was just recently updated um, in our instance of EPIC um, in response to um, a couple survey findings. Um, so several of the charts that we reviewed um, with one of our recent um, joint commission surveys, um, we had um, patients that received um, tenecticlase boluses when their blood pressure was not within range. Um, and, um, you know, I think we had concerns um, that that was potentially happening kind of widespread across the system. Um, I don't know if, you know, the ease of administration kind of, um, you know, nurses were, um, you know, maybe rushing a little bit more um, to get the bolus in and not, um, you know, just pulling down um, that um, most recent blood pressure from, um, you know, from their monitor before um, administering. So um, we have updated our medication administration record. So we now have a hard stop where um, you cannot sign off on the medication until you pull down that blood, blood pressure um, just prior to administration. Um, so that um, I think is a is a big improvement um, and one that um, we've just recently implemented. So I don't have um, 
results yet on that, but um, we'll continue to um, audit and, and um, look at our progress across the system um, with that change. And then as far as post connect to place monitoring and care, um, again, we went with the standard of care for vital sign and neurological assessment. Um, the caveat to that is um, in a separate um, QI initiative um, that we just launched, um, trying to decompress um, our um, ICUs at our, at our comprehensive stroke centers, um, we are piloting a low intensity um, vital sign and neurological assessment with patients um, who are admit, admitted to um, our neuro um, inter, intermediate um, care unit at Southdale. Um, that initiative just launched and, and um, we don't have results, but um, that is the one exception um, across our system right now um, where we are um, not following the historical standard of care for vital sign and neurological assessment. Um, so definitely, um, again, uh, continue with those with those um, frequent vital sign and, and neurological assessments. And then um, again, most of our patients are admitted to an ICU setting um, to closely monitor for um, those complications of intracranial uh, systemic head hemorrhage and, um, and angioedema. Um, we added an angioedema uh, management panel um, and um, instructions to um, administer uh, medications um, with any signs or symptoms of um, angioedema. Um, we have actually used the panel um, a few times and um, fortunately um, we have not had any serious um, adverse um, effects um, for patients. So I think we've used the angioedema management panel um, three times um, in the last year. And then again, um, we implemented um, same strict blood pressure parameters um, and then included um, a pre-checked blood pressure um, medication management panel um, with levetal, hydralazine, and nicardipine um, for our patients um, post-thrombolytic. One thing that we did is we um, shortened the duration of bed rest um, following tenecteplase from 24 hours to six hours. Um, we largely did that um, because I don't believe that there is really um, extensive evidence to um, support 24 hours bed rest. Um, it was kind of a historical practice. Um, and we really want to mobilize these patients um, as quickly as possible. And then also um, ensure that um, our rehab services are able to assess, evaluate, and um, begin interventions as quickly as possible. Um, and so we found that we had a lot of times, you know, um, PT and um, PT in particular, um, they were delaying evaluating the patient um, because of that 24 hour um, bed rest um, order. So that was another change um, for our system um, with the implementation of Tenecteplase. And then some of our um, initial results. Um, so our um, benefits, um, and, and these are the benefits that, um, you know, administration and leadership is, is really um, focusing on and celebrating. So in 2021, um, between February of 2021 and December of, um, we administered 230 doses of tenecteplase across the system, and that resulted in um, around $315,000 in savings for our system. So um, that was a that was a significant um, significant win, and um, certainly something that that is um, celebrated. And then additionally, and and this really came, I think, with the um, stroke care pathway in its entirety, but we did reduce our excess length of um, stay from um, 0.88 to 0.68 days. Um, again, that's in all stroke discharges, um, not just limited to those um, post-thrombolysis patients. Um, and we have multiple strategies, you know, really, I think, driving that standardization of care that's helping with that. Um, but they did include, um, as I mentioned, shortening our bed rest to six hours. Um, you know, which which I think did contribute to um, driving down that excess length of stay. 
And then um, interestingly, our um, rate of symptomatic um, intracranial hemorrhage um, in alteplase versus tenecteplase has also um, decreased dramatically. So um, in 2019, um, our, with alteplase only, our symptomatic um, ICH rate was around 3.6%. Um, in 2020, and that 2020 number actually includes about six weeks of, of um, alteplase administration in 2021, it's 2.7%. Um, and then in um, 2021 through first quarter of this year, um, it's down to 1% um, with tenecteplase. And I don't know, Dr. Stribe, do you want to make any comments? Um, do you have any um, thoughts as to why we're seeing um, that rate drop with the transition to tenecteplase? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think that, um, you know, when you do look at uh, sort of these trials, uh, it, it essentially has always been equivalent to alteplase or maybe just slightly lower. You know, whether this is uh, a, a true number that's lower or just um, a lower number overall, I'm, I'm not sure. There's a few other things that happened through this time, which is uh, basically all thrombolysis within ML Fairview came under the, the university program. So there's a little bit different uh, level of supervision of, of thrombolytics that, that some of us spoke. And, um, you know, it, it also could be sort of uh, an aberration. It's only been a year and um, the symptomatic internal hemorrhage cases aren't, they're not very many. So when you get one, it does bump your percentage you know, by quite a bit potentially when it happens. Um, so, you know, we're, we're obviously very happy with it, whether or not it holds within our system, at least on the uh, ML therapy side that we've done, we've, we've kind of been between one and 2%. Um, and so that is, um, you know, we're, we're on the low side here and hopefully we'll stay that way, whether or not it's a true difference where we are planning a, a more comprehensive statistical analysis for publication where we're looking at other um, factors that impact whether or not you bleed, which would be the NIH stroke scale and presentation, some of the pre-existing medications that you have. And so uh, a controlled analysis of these numbers will probably tell us a little bit more, and uh, hopefully we'll have that uh, data here in the next month or two. All right, and then the downside um, with the transition to a tenecteplase. Um, Dr. Scheib, do you wanna go ahead and, and come in on this? and? And how it's impacted um, practice. Yeah, I think this is really sort of important. The the tenex place rollout has been sort of quite successful. People really like it, especially the nurse, nursing EDs uh, and pharmacy because it, it is truly easier. Um, but there is a is a caveat. It does change how we we treat the patient a little bit. And in some emergency departments, the workflow has to be modified more than others. So essentially. Um, Due to rapid bullet administration, tenecteplase cannot be undone. If one minute later or two minutes later, you find out information that makes the patient ineligible for tenecteplase, uh, you, you've already given it. And, and of course, you uh, can't really do a whole lot about it. I don't know what other people's experience with, um, with lytics is. I've been a part of multiple uh, cases where uh, alteplase was mixed early and we wanted to evaluate the patient more. We were still trying to find information from the family. Uh, and then I, I turned around and, and all the place was actually hanging and, and the bullets had been given. And had that happened in something like um, next to place, then again, you're done. You, you don't give 10% of your drug, you give it all. And if you had sort of changed your mind or decided that they were not eligible, um, you don't have that sort of safety point of being able to say, okay, we'll just stop the infusion. We only gave 10 or 15%. It's really unlikely to do anything. Um, so that, that changes things. So we don't mix in advance because, you know, having tenecte place sitting there in a syringe with an order for the nurses, of course, the nurse sees it and they want to treat quickly and there's an order in Epic, they're, they're going to give it. So we don't mix um, and, until we're sort of sure that, that we're ready to give, which may slow down things in a, in a really straightforward case sometimes. Also, some places will mix even prior to the head CT, which is not a practice that I encourage and it's actually not encouraged by Genentech in terms of replacing uh, mixed um, lytics that you had reasonable uh, intention to, to give. If you talk to them, the feedback that I've gotten, that does not include you know, mixing without having your, your imaging done. Uh, but, but places will do that. If they have high suspicion for ischemic stroke, they'll mix in advance. Uh, and then of course, 
uh, if you mix an exaplase in advance, you you lose that money that it's not being replaced by Genentech. And so, um, you know, you have to look at how often you're wasting uh, a medication to determine one, if Genentech will be cost effective for you or not. And two, um, you know, you again, you do have to think about it when you're treating patients. So um, we don't sort of mix right away. There, there is a little bit of more of a threshold uh, because the, the margin of error is a little bit higher. And of course, you know, there's the financial side. Now, if we're really confident we're going to give, we don't mind wasting Tenexaplase. That's fine. We're always doing what's best for the patient. Uh, but at the same time, it is something to, to consider uh, in advance of, of how places run stroke codes. And I'll say that within our system, uh, there's probably one hospital that um, you know, ran stroke codes quite differently, and this has had an impact on them uh, in terms of the way that they, they run stroke codes. Um, so it's it's something that we've had to look at and, and think about. And I think really the thing to, to be careful with is you can't mix too early and have next place uh, around because, um, you know, if you come in and the family later says, oh, they're actually on this um, DOAC, you know, or that actually the, the onset was, was yesterday. When, when you're not clear that that's happened, uh, again, with CPA, if you're 99% sure, go ahead and start because, you know, you can just stop the infusion. But with uh, connected place, if the family's on the way in and I don't have that final answer, I'm not going to, to mix it and, and give it and have it ready uh, and, until I'm sort of 100% sure. And so it, it is a different workflow. Mentally, it's a different workflow. And again, for some sites who mix really early and just leave the drug out for the patient, at, at, at least, uh, you know, I wouldn't advise it with next place because once you give it, you've given it. And, um, you know, if it really turns out there's a major contraindication, you potentially could could cause harm. So this is something that's come up and we've, we've dealt with. I think overall the experience is still really positive, but of course, you know, if, we're, if you're learning from uh, our implementation process, this is something that we've, we've dealt with and, and consider, continue to think about. All right, and then just in conclusion, um, the evidence suggests that um, Tenecteplase is um, equivalent um, not inferior or potentially superior to Altaplace. Um, the best evidence um, is for the um, 0.25 milligrams um, per kilogram with a max dose of 25 milligrams. Um, and it may be most effective in recanalization of large vessel occlusion. Um, it's potentially more cost effective. It's easier to administer, but again, the caveat to that is um, it's not replaced by Genentech um, if administered. And um, I think you know, there, there are those um, safety concerns if it was um, administered in a patient um, who is then later to determine, determine to have a contraindication. Um, as far as implementation, really lean on your um, key, key stakeholders and um, your champions um, for your education and um, implementation plan. Um, don't underestimate the work um, that it is going to take to update your protocols, your documentation templates, um, your electronic medical record. Um, again, I would advise to keep that education focused on the differences and what's changing um, between Altaplace and Tenecteplase. Um, and then make sure that you're celebrating um, you know, your success early and, and celebrating often. And then as far as safety and monitoring, um, again, um, to avoid unnecessary medication errors, um, our recommendation is um, a single um, standard IV thrombolytic, single dose. Um, make sure that your um, inclusion and exclusion criteria um, are up to date. Um, and again, they're, they're comparable, um, almost identical um, to um, what we use with Altaplace. Um, I would advise having a specific um, Tenecteplase order um, that is specific for ischemic stroke, um, again, to avoid um, any potential for dosing errors. Um, and then again, um, in our experience, um, we've learned that we think that um, hard stop with that final blood pressure check um, just prior to administration um, is another um, good safety recommendation. And then as far as um, monitoring both pre and um, post administration, um, use your standard of care for your vital signs, um, neurological assessments. And again, um, I would advise um, at least initially 
um, continuing with your standard of care for um, patient placement to monitor monitor for those um, potential complications of angioedema, um, intracranial, and um, systemic hemorrhage. So I think we'll stop there. And um, I think we've got a few minutes. We can open it up for questions. Wonderful. I want to thank you both so much for your time today and your, sharing your experience and knowledge with all of our statewide hospitals. We are right at a little bit over time and I want to respect your time. Yep, there is two questions in the chat. Do you have a moment to address those or we can address those? Yeah, I, I, I'm happy to stay on. Sorry, I actually thought we would be until 11, so I'm happy to answer questions. And if there's Super. others, I can stay personally um, and, and, and answer them. Um, so. I'll answer these and then Sarah, if you have anything to add, you can, I think they're fairly straightforward. So what was the process of communicating with the EMS partners of the change to connect the plates? Um, we actually did not have formal communication. I think in terms, we um, have really a, quite a few EMS partners at, at our um, hospitals. You know, I couldn't tell you how many we, we work with, but really quite a few. And um, our goals with, with EMS, there's, there's sort of many things that um, are, are actually higher priority in terms of working with them and pre-activation pre and things like that. So we did not um, have a sort of formal communication with EMS, so maybe that's something that we should should look at. It's um, certainly very reasonable. We do do stroke education with them, and I think you know talking to them about the next place would be good, um, but um, there wasn't formal communication. Um, the next one is, did I see or did we see an increase in stroke expansion in cases due to decrease of six hours bed rest? You know, we, we don't, I, I don't think there's actually very many stroke patients that are, are really that perfusion dependent or that, um, you know, they have so much penumbra there that if you're up and, and moving around that, um, that that's going to, to make a difference. Now, if we have patients that are um, uh, sort of in that um, um, uh, difficult situation, they are typically in the ICU and be monitored closely and we would just discontinue the, um, the non-bed rest order. We would keep them flat. Uh, and, and bad, they typically have sort of bed rest order or flattened bed order to 30 degrees. Um, so in, in those few cases, and we personally don't see very many, um, we would just change the standard order. Um, and, and so otherwise, no, I don't think we've seen any stroke expansion that we would um, sort of attribute to, to being up and, and moving around. Um, okay, one to connect with Sarah about post next place monitoring outside the ICU. Um, any dosing errors? No, we haven't seen dosing errors. The, um, it would be really hard, and, and that's thank, thanks to, to uh, Sarah and the work with ML Fairview really on the EPIC side. I mean, it would be very hard to um, to order one thing and get the other. In fact, I, I don't know if you could do it. If you really tried to order TPA for stroke within our system at this point, I think it would redirect you to next to place. And then, um, the order is calculated directly off the weight from the patient uh, in the text place order. So I think it would be very hard to um, to dose it incorrectly. Um, and then angioedema panel, uh, how is our angioedema panel different from standard anaphylaxis order? Um, the angioedema panel follows the AJ guidelines in terms of um, drug administration. I don't know what the standard anaphylaxis kit actually looks like. So. Um, I guess I would need that uh, that information, but we could probably share a screenshot of the angioedema panel, um, and then if if it is emailed out, you could see what it looks like. Sarah, did you have anything to add to these questions? Um, just with the angioedema panel, I know um, prior to um, creating that panel, I think we were kind of follow following a standard anaphylaxis pathway, and I believe that the um, major difference was that all three medications um, are given, um, not, you know, one weight for response, another weight for response. Um, I, I believe that was um, kind of the difference between the guidelines and, um, you know, what we had prior to the panel. And then, um, Sarah, what um, interaction did you have with pharmacy around uh, around MI? Um, I actually, I, I can't comment on MI. I don't know if they use separate kits. I think, again, in Epic for our orders, the order is coming through a stroke order set with specific dosing. 
built in. You can't really change it um, unless you like cleared everything out and free text the the dose in. So if you really wanted to change it for some reason, you, you could, you'd still be maxed out at 25 milligrams. So you wouldn't be able to use the MI dosing anyway, because you, you know, in almost every case would, would exceed that. Um, so I, I think the order set sort of prevents um, the, um, the sort of using a, an MI dose and, a, and an MI kit for tonight to place. But I, I didn't have any direct discussions with uh, pharmacy about that. Sarah, did you? No, so I've got to, I have to, um, we can follow up on that and um, connect with our lead pharmacist and find out um, what they're using as far as kits across the system. Yeah, okay, a few other questions. Um, we see, are we seeing underdosing with estimated weights? We really are actually fighting estimated weights. It's become um, more prevalent how often this is happening within the system because we're now focused on it. Um, and and we, we don't actually allow estimated weights. So that um, is something that we're, we're working on. I've seen estimated weights being higher and lower. So I, I think they're just wrong in, in general. Um, that's actually an initiative that we're working on to make sure that everyone gets a bed weight and that they get it quickly within the stroke code or like a, a scale weight. And then in terms of site visits, there's no concern about the next place. In fact, um, they they actually seem to to like it and, and like the innovation. Uh, obviously, you know, there's a lot of work that went along with it. We didn't just say, hey, we switched and, and, and now we have to next place. Um, so I, I think if you're implementing it sort of rigorously, you understand the data and the decisions that were made. I think that uh, in, in terms of accreditation visits, it seemed favorably and as a, you know, as a program that's pushing things forward. Um, so as long, again, as long as it's done uh, well and, and with an understanding of the data and education that has to happen, I think that'll be totally fine. I think I'll go ahead and jump in here. Um, there are some great kind of nuanced questions coming in. Maybe we could be glad to to connect Maria to Sarah, if that's okay with some of these additional yeah, questions, sure. just in sure. just in respect of everyone's time. Uh, this was just yeah phenomenal. Thank you again for sharing your insight with us. And just a couple final housekeeping here. There is a link to the survey. You have to scroll through, scroll up on the chat just a bit here. Please ensure you get that completed to get your contact hour for today. And as a reminder, this webinar was recorded and so will be available for future viewing if you wanted to share further with colleagues that weren't able to join in. I will be sending a follow-up email with a link to that once that's all set up on our YouTube playlist, including the slide deck for today and additional resources that we we talked about. So again, these are great questions. I'll hang on the line here just to capture some of these questions and then maybe we can connect with you, Sarah and Dr. Stride, just to get kind of those last last um, questions answered if MDH can't answer them ourselves. So again, thank you everyone for joining us today. We'll go ahead and mute our lines. And again, I'll just stay on to grab a few of these last questions and we'll get them in writing. Thanks everyone, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much.